Greetings and salutations, everybody. I uh, hope you're all doing well, considering. Uh, my name's Brian Ewald, and I've been making my living with a guitar since I was about 17, which is uh, a long time. Won't say exactly how long, but a uh, long time. And um, lots of different aspects of the music business, from tours and bar gigs to session stuff to teaching, you name it. Uh, and one thing I go back to as much as I can is teaching. I love to do it. And I'm going to give a free lesson um, uh, on what I kind of feel is the most single most important topic that has helped me do what I do. Uh, I can't tell you how many situations I've been in, jobs I could not have accepted without knowing uh, the fundamentals of what I'm about to show you uh, as a guitar player and as a musician. Uh, I've had hundreds thousands of students in my life, uh, I'm sure, over the years. Uh, my students have come from a variety of backgrounds. Most of them are people who've been playing for a long time. Um, uh, typically, they're asking to learn to uh, improve their improvisational skills uh, or just learn how to improv uh, if they haven't, uh, work on their ear for figuring out songs, uh, just add some variety and spice to their playing lead or rhythm. Uh, break out of ruts. Maybe they're bored of the way they play. I mean, that's all very common. We all go through that on some level, no matter how long you've been playing. Uh, but I really kind of found with 99% of my students that have come to me, it's the same missing puzzle piece that's really the root of most every issue that can help people break through those ruts. Um, all right, let's get into the lesson. So I'm going to use food as an analogy because I think it works really well with music and understanding it. Um, we all eat every day, um, so we can all relate to it in a different way. A lot of guitar players, to me, approach music uh, the way somebody would learn how to cook. You learn some recipes. Um, maybe your your mom or your dad or your you know grandparents you know taught you some skills, and and you can be really good at it and make some delicious dishes. A true chef learns the fundamentals of how proteins break down in different heat sources, how fats and acids work together and, and how they react in making a dish. Um, there's layers to it to understand, and it takes a little bit of time to learn that. But once you have those fundamental skills, you could throw a good chef ingredients they've never seen before uh, I mean, there's TV shows about this, right? You know, you can put weird things in a basket that don't typically sound good together and using their fundamental skills of understanding what kind of protein this is, or I can use this as a fat, I can use this, and tasting as they go, they can create something creative and hopefully delicious, right? If all you know how to do is recreate recipes and somebody throws you in that situation, you're probably lost. It's a lot like musicians who you can learn lots of songs, uh, but you can easily get thrown into a position where you're like, I don't know what to do with this group of chords or whatever. We want to learn how to be great chefs on our instrument, complete musicians, uh, and use our ear and the fundamentals that we learn to be creative and create and not just only be able to recreate the recipes that we've been taught or figured out. Okay, and we're going to talk about what our ingredients are as a musician, right? Okay, we have 12 ingredients, right? And people always, this is a, a cliche line. Music is all made from the same 12 notes, uh, which there are 12 notes, not seven notes, A through G. We have other ones, and it's not eight notes in an octave, right? 12 notes are our chromatic scale. There's seven natural notes, and then the sharps and flats, the five sharps and flats in between, but they're just as important. So... We'll talk about that in a second, but, you know, we have our 12 ingredients and people say often like same 12 notes in opera in jazz and classical and, you know, blues, bluegrass. And yes, that's true, but there's another important layer to that to me that is a lot more helpful. If we have a single note, it's just a tone. Pick up the phone. It's a dial tone or it used to be. That's a tone. It's not bluesy or jazzy or major or minor or happy. It's just a tone. It's not until you put two notes together that we create a sound that we think of as musical. Those, to me, are our ingredients. Two notes together. It's an interval, okay? So we're going to talk 
today about numbers. So you may hear people using numbers all the time. Um, a lot of people, I watch these comments and some of these guitar and instructional YouTube things where people start talking theory and a lot of people just glass over and go, oh, you lost me when you started doing that. And that's, that's common. A lot of people don't quite understand when somebody starts talking about, oh, you move this up a minor third or oh, there's a, a G6 chord or it's a two five one progression, a one four five progression. You know the numbers are everywhere. The nice thing is they're very easy to learn. It's a way that you can learn something from a song you like, understand what you like about it, and bring it out in your own playing, or morph it and change it if you want to. If you understand how these twelve ingredients work, just like you can learn how to recognize an ingredient like salt, once you taste it by itself and you understand how it works, that's just like one of your intervals. You know when something could use more of it or has too much of it. You can learn to hear these distances. You don't have to have perfect pitch. It's partially just learning how to understand what they're called. Like I said, there's only 12 of them. Same, if we're talking about an interval, it's from one note to another. It's just the distance between two notes. When people talk about chords, like a one chord or a two, five, one, they're talking about the exact same distances, but we're talking about from the root note of this chord to the root note of that chord to the root note of other. So it's the exact same thing as whether we're talking about from one note to another or from a chord to another chord. The way we're going to think of these numbers, and there's 12 of them, just like there's 12 notes, but there are seven natural numbers before it repeats back over. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then starts over. But we have numbers in between, just like we have F sharp and G flat. You have a note in between one and two, a note in between two and three. There are two spots where the numbers are half steps, three to four and seven back to one. So we'll get back into that in just a second. But first we're gonna talk about the numbers as intervals, just the distance between two notes. That is the building block. Those are ingredients for every chord we play, every riff we play, every scale. As a matter of fact, the theory behind what a riff is or what a chord is or what a scale is, they're all the same. Understanding them, becomes pretty much the same pot of ingredients. It's just a scale might have more notes in it than a chord, uh, but it's still just a group of intervals. And once you see them as that, the mystery is gone about how they work together, how you can take an idea from a scale and use it in a chord, how you can take an idea from a chord and use it for a riff or a scale, how you can take something that somebody's singing or playing and figure out exactly what it is you like about it and put it in your own playing and or morph it and learn how to change it. So we're not going to get all into the how, like how to do all that just now, but we just un want to understand what these numbers mean. When I teach this fully, like what we'll do in the summer camp and what I do in my lessons, we get deep into understanding what each interval sounds like. It's like learning your 12 spices. How do we build chords with this? How do I build scales with this? Um, and not only is it not difficult, uh, it's incredibly empowering. So this is going to be like a, PDF that um, will be available through the camp um, and you can cut out on these dotted lines and I'll show you how you can make it just it'll print up on an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. So if you look down here, if I start with any note, the root note, the open blocks where these gray spots are right now would be the interval of a second. If you notice, there's that half step, third to the fourth the interval of a fifth, the interval of a sixth, the interval of a seventh, and a half step back to the octave. So in other words, if I wanted to put this on a G note, I can take this block, put it on G, and it'll show you that the second, the interval of a second from G is an A, the interval of a third from G is a B, the interval of a fourth, a C, and so forth. These also happen to be the notes of the G major scale. So this is not necessarily meant so you can carry this around with you always. Um, once you understand the pattern of it and how to find it, there's lots of ways to find out how to find intervals and the patterns and the geometry of the fretboard is super repetitive. When you see how it all boils down, you can look from one note, see how the basic intervals revolve around it and it explains everything about chord shapes and riffs. Um, but so this is a good way to visualize the distances. So you can always see what interval anything creates. So here's what B would look like. So there we have B. Its second would be C sharp or D flat. Now, which should we call it? We should call it C sharp because we want everything to make sense with the alphabet. We don't want to go B to some sort of D to some sort of E or 
than to a natural E. We don't want to have repetition. We don't have want to have two types of E notes or two types of D notes or no D note whatsoever. So we want one of each of the alphabetic letters. B would go to C sharp, then D sharp, then E, then F sharp, G sharp, A sharp, back to B. That would give us the B major scale or the intervals of B. Okay. Now, that's just basically what the numbers mean. So if somebody is talking about playing, let's say, a D minor chord, and then they say it's a D minor six chord. Well, if I put this on D, if we notice the sixth interval is a B note, I can take a D minor chord that I know, and if I can find a way to put a B note, like let's say lifting off this finger and playing the open B string, what I just did was I added a B note to a D minor chord. That B is a sixth interval to D. So I just played a D minor six. So that's how that would work in the case of a chord. Or if somebody sang a B note over any type of D, a major or minor, they're singing the interval of a sixth. Each of these intervals has a very distinct sound. You can learn to hear them. Once you get into understanding these 12 ingredients, they make up everything. Let's look at how the numbers just in the basic concept of how the numbers work with chords, okay? There's a lot of information on this sheet, and I'm not necessarily going to talk about all of it in this little thing, but um, if you notice on the bottom here, I have Roman numerals. Those are representing the chords of a major key. And the little green blocks are for major chords, and the little yellow blocks are minor chords. And this last one is a diminished, specifically a half diminished or a minor seven flat five. We're not going to worry about that right now. What we're going to basically see is that every key, every major key, has three major chords and three minor chords. Every minor key has the same thing. Major keys and minor keys are identical to one another. Every major key has a minor key that's, you could think of it as its sister key, its relative minor key, or vice versa. Like for the example, I'm going to put this on, let's say we'll go back to G. In the key of G, where we have one as the major, here's E. The key of E minor and the key of G major are exactly the same in their notes. The difference is just semantics. Playing in the key of E minor would be these notes. Playing in the key of G major, it really just depends on which chord you're focusing on. But for our purposes, to get our answers on this stuff, we'll just talk about it as a major key. This is what the modes are. The modes are talking about a major scale and considering each one of these positions our root note or our one and changing our perspective and learning a, s a new set of rules based on calling a different note our root note. There are a bunch of names for the same thing. One scale with seven names. So the major scale happens to be one. The natural minor happens to be one. We don't need to worry about understanding those to get the sounds out of them. And I'm going to show you a way we can use them. Even if you haven't been doing this long, a way we can actually get the sounds of the modes and understand with some standard chord progressions how we can find a scale pattern form. Okay, so let's say we know a shape. All we need is one shape of a major scale. I'll show you one to start with. Here it is as a C major scale. Some people might look at it and go, wait, that's a natural minor scale. I know that one, or the Aeolian mode. Yes, it is. You can use it for all kinds of things. But where I've put the little R's, the little root notes, if you play it to that note, or if, it doesn't mean you have to start on that note, but if you place it on the neck, wherever that R note lands, you're playing it as a major scale to that note. If I wanted to play this as a D major scale, I would just move it up a whole step or put any one of these R notes on a D note, and it would give me a D major scale. If you can understand that and how to play that and move that scale around, you can play any major scale, all 12 major scales with that one shape, Okay. So let's say we use that shape, and now we want to look at a chord progression and know what scale we can use with it. We can also use this as a just a jamming and a songwriting tool. Let's start there. Let's say the C major scale that I just put up on the neck, or the, the, that whatever, on the screen. Yeah, you know what I mean. Let's say I want to make up a chord progression and use that scale I put up. I want to know what chords are in the key of C. Well, I drag this little thing over a C. And it's going to give me the three major and three minor chords that work with that scale. A C major chord is the one chord. D minor 
is the two chord, E minor is the three chord, F major is the four chord, G major is the five chord, and then here we have the six chord or minor. So C major, D minor, E minor, F major, G major, A minor. Those six chords, all of them, three of them, four of them, whether I'm playing a C chord or not, will work great with this scale. I can play that scale to those chords. I can play just D minor and E minor back and forth. So make up chord progressions, make up 12 chord progressions from those. Make some of them long progressions where you're using most of them. Make some of them just two chords. Uh, play, play one where you're just hanging on the F chord the whole time, but play the C major scale over it. But what you wanna do when you do that is don't think of it like I'm playing D minor to E minor. Think I'm playing the two chord to the three chord. Turn these, start trying to think of these generically as the numbers. Not only will it make sense when other people are talking about it, but you'll start understanding the role of what the two chord sounds like in a song and what a four chord sounds like in a song. There are three major chords in every key, but each has its own sound and a role within a key. So a one chord is that it's gonna end here, like if the song were to end on the cheesiest, most obvious major chord, that's the one chord. And the five chord tends to wanna push your ear to the one chord. We can use that just to make tracks to jam to. Pick any key you want. If you wanna switch this to an E major scale, move this pattern up so these two R's land on the 12th fret on those E's, you'll have an E major scale. And then go back to our little thing here, move this to any E note, and you'll have the three major chords and three minor chords that work to that. Make up some songs. This, this is the way I visualize it. I picture it like this little block, like a domino, six on a domino, those, you know. So, Instead of looking at it, this little diagram I showed you looks at how this breaks down linearly on one string. And it's cool because there you see the whole steps and half steps. You see the one chord to the two chords, a whole step. Two to three is a whole step. Then we have three and four, that little half step. And four to five are a whole step. Five to six is a whole step. Six to seven, even though we're not dealing with seven as a chord, it's diminished chord right now, would be a whole step. And then the, the seventh note back to the to the octave or the root again is, is a half step. But basically this is the block that we want to concern ourselves with. Well, this is looking at that same block just in a different layout instead of on one string on two adjacent strings. So now let's look at the key of let's say A. I put it here. Now this, what I do on the guitar, I visualize this little pattern. Like I just put on there. Okay, A, B, that would be C sharp or D flat. We're going to call it C sharp, right? Because we just left a B. We want some kind of C. Now we have D, E, and F sharp. Those six notes make up the root notes of the major and minor chords of the key of A. Now, specifically, it makes this little pattern. I think of it as like two Tetris blocks going like that, right? We've got the major chords, the green ones, going like this. And then we've got the minor chords going like that. So we have A major is our one, B minor is our two, C sharp minor is our three, D major is our four, E major is our five, and F sharp minor is our six. So I could play any of those chords, play an A major scale. Now, using that block though, let's say we're not picking a key, matching it to a scale that we already have predetermined. We have a couple chords we're trying to figure out what scale we can use with it. Okay, so before we wrap this up, we're gonna look at a couple examples, starting off with a single chord and choosing a scale for it. And then a couple just small two chord chord progressions or three chord chord progressions and how you figure out what your options are for scale. Um, so you think one chord, it's not really a chord progression, right? It's just a chord. But let's say, you're sitting around with a friend and you're just jamming for a little bit and somebody's just doing this little kind of riff that's around, let's say, an E chord, okay? And you want to solo to it. So you might go minor pentatonic. Maybe you've messed around with that. So you have that option.
not great to me for a, a very major application. It's cool for something bluesy. Over that, it was a little eh. So maybe you know the major pentatonic, which would be three frets lower. That's better, that works, right? But let's say you want something a little more interesting or you want some other options, okay? Uh, maybe you don't know the major pentatonic, whatever. This is how we can use this to find that. If I take this C major scale, in that position, I move that note up to an E note and play that same shape, I have an E major scale. Well, obviously an E major chord and an E major scale makes sense, right? So let's try it. Works, right? You would assume it would, right? It's E major scale, E major chord. But that's not our only option as far as major scales, because let's think about it. That's playing it as if there's no chord progression, so we're making E sound like a one chord, about as major and inside as possible. So the next thing we're going to kind of talk about is really the same effect of playing modes modally, but without having to get real fancy on it right now. So how many keys? There's 12 keys, right? How many of those contain an E major chord? Three, right? There's three major chords. So E can land once where it's the one, once where it's the four, once where it's the five. If this was the same thing, but on a minor chord, it could land in three keys also. Once where it's the two, once where it's the three, and once where it's the six. So let's go through. We just heard this. We just heard E as if it's the one chord. We played an E major scale over an E chord. But now what if I move down and put E in the place of the four chord? E is the four in the key of B. So the key of B would have B major, C sharp minor, D sharp minor, E major, there's our chord, F sharp major, and G sharp major. Or G sharp minor would be the six. But we're just hanging on a chord, but this is what it would sound like to hear it as if E was our four chord, okay? Not the four chord of E, but what E is the four of, in this case, B. So I'm gonna take that same shape and now just put those R notes on a B note. So I'm gonna play a B major scale over this E. So if any of you have ever messed with modes, that's the Lydian mode, okay? You're playing the fourth mode, but if that's complicated, don't worry about it right now. You just heard what it sounds like to play it as a four chord. Now we have one major chord left. We did the one, we did the four. Now what happens if we play E as the five chord? So I'll move this, put E in the space of the five chord. That lands in the key of A major. So I'll play that same pattern, but this time now I'm gonna put those R notes on A. Right there, what you were hearing was playing E as a five chord. That's what a five chord sounds like. It's bluesier, it's the Mixolydian mode. But again, you just heard an E chord being played over an A major scale, which is the five chord. That's what you wanna remember. Just think of it as that's what a five chord sounds like. So if we have a one chord jam, if it's a major chord, you have three keys that you can try and figure out which sound you like, or maybe jump between them, okay? So once where it's the one, the four, or the five. If it's a minor chord, you have the same choices, just put it in the spot of the two, the three, or the six, okay? Now let's say we have two chords, which could be telling us specifically, this is your better choice, okay? How often do we have songs that are just one chord all the way through? Not too often. But let's start with our E chord still, and just add another one. Let's say it goes E major to F sharp minor, okay? Okay, so I just made a quick loop of E to F sharp minor. So let's check our keys and figure out if this tells us specifically where we wanna be. Well, let's put E back in the place of one. Let's just start there, it doesn't really matter. E major is a one, 
F sharp minor is the two chord. Perfect. That works. So I can play an E major scale. But just out of curiosity, let's see if it works anywhere else. If I put E in the spot of the four chord, F sharp is in there, but it's supposed to be major or seventh, right? So that's not going to sound very good. What if I put E in the place of the five chord? E, F sharp minor. That works there too. So in other words, it could either be a one to a two chord in the key of E, or I could play it as a five chord to a six chord again in the key of A. So I'm gonna try an E major scale over it and then I'll play an A major. So let's listen. Here's an E major. Very Almond Brothers-y, right? Major inside, sounds great. Here's an A major scale. A little bit bluesier, a little darker, okay? That's hearing it as a five chord to a six chord. And here was hearing it as a one chord to a two chord. So you can decide which way you like it. Sometimes that'll be the case. You might have a, a if there's only one or two chords, maybe even three chords, sometimes you might find multiple keys that it works. More often than not though, there's gonna be a specific key that works the best. All right, let's look at one more very simple two chord chord progression, but one that you could probably stump a lot of guitar players uh, to where they would be hunting and pecking and trying to find the right scale because the minor pentatonic route does not work well at all for this chord progression. Just G major to A major. Okay, so let's look at our key options. Now, we can move this we can pick any of the chords in the chord progression. If there was four chords, I could pick any of them. Remember, every chord can only happen in three different keys. Well, if it's major, it's the one, four, five. It's minor, it's the two, three, or six. So let's just start with the first chord, G. Let's put G as the one and see if that works for G major, A major. Well, in the key of G, we have G major, but A would be minor. So that would be a one chord to a two chord, but this is our one chord major and our two chord major. Doesn't work in that key, okay? So now let's put G where it is, let's say the five right here, right? So that's all in the key of C, but G major is the five and A would be the minor again for the six. Doesn't work. So let's put in the last spot where our major chord works, the four. G major is our four, A major is our five works, right? It's a four to a five, back and forth, where I never play the one, I never play D, but that is the key of D. It works in the key of D. Okay, let me show you too. If I, I'm in the key of D where I never play the D chord or the one chord, I'm going four, five, four, five, but let me show you what it sounds like when I do go to the one. Right? The D chord has that sound of like the cheesiest, most obvious and so it does, you can hear that those two chords work in that key of D. You can hear four chord, five chord, four chord, five chord, one, right? But here's a little loop of just playing the four and five. G to A, right? Where a G major scale doesn't work and an A major scale doesn't work. My only two chords in the song and I'm not in either of those keys. But here's a D major scale. There's not a bad note in the D major scale with that chord progression. So I'm playing a four to a five where I never play the one. So I'm gonna wrap it up, but let me tell you just a quick couple little dead giveaways to look for. Look at this pattern. Don't feel like you have to always have this little thing with you. Remember this block, major, the next two, two and three are minor, then 
four and five are major, six is minor. Practice getting to know the names of the notes on the neck with moving this around and being able to figure out, okay, in the key of G, test yourself. What are the six chords in the key of G? What are the six chords? Try harder ones like B flat and then check yourself with this thing. Put this on a B flat and see if you were right with the names of what chords would go into it. If you're looking at a chord progression and you're trying to find quickly, so you don't have this with you, you're trying to find some clues to guess what chord key, what key that chord progression might be in. Look for some dead giveaways, like two major chords a whole step only happen in the four and the five, the one's off by itself, right? Two and three chords are minor chords a whole step apart, and the six, the only other minor chord is off by itself. So if I see two minor chords, they don't have to be side by side in the progression, but if at one time I see a B minor chord, and then something else goes on, and then I see an A minor chord, well, I see B minor and A minor. The only spot two minor chords work a whole step apart are the three and the two, three, two, one. Those would work with the key of G. Of course, you may try this with some songs and go, it doesn't work anywhere. So what does that mean that's happening? There's a key change. Not all songs stay with in one key, but the only way to get used to know what to do when songs dip out of key, whether it's subtly or big changes, is if this makes sense to you and you can learn how to think this way, every song I play, this is how I think of it. I turn it into numbers.